I forgot to record last time. Okay. I started recording it. Do you have the one for last Thursday? No, fortunately not. Oh, well. Anyway, so only my, like one or zero people um, watch the recording, so. Okay. Um, so any ideas for the cooling? And also, why is cooling important, at least to us? Well, cooling is important because you cannot form stars or anything else. You cannot accrete matter if the medium is very hot. You know, the, the pressure is very, very high. They're just going to be bouncing off each other. They're never going to um, coalesce. For the cooling mechanism, we'll see that they're actually pretty uh, restricted. So one mechanism is um, electron-proton recombination, as I mentioned over there. So we saw last time that the heating rate or the heating function is alpha, density of the electrons, density of the protons, and the average energy of um, the uh, photoelectrons. So if they are in thermodynamic equilibrium, this is a heating function. The cooling function is uh, lambda. Then you will need the same thing. You know, it will also be proportional to the densities of, of protons and electrons. Uh, and here you will have the. Um, I guess this is not average. Mm, oh, it's average. Recombination um, energy. So, the electrons are going to be uh, knocked off the hydrogen atoms, but then they can interact uh, with each other. And they, they are going to um, scatter each other off. So, the velocities, you know, they're going to be thermalized, essentially. So the distribution of the velocities of the electrons is going to be the Maxwell-Boltzmann uh, distribution, which looks kind of like this. So this side is a little um, longer, like that. So the electrons are going to have um, an effective temperature, Te, something that you know, we also have in, in metals. Uh, the electronic temperature can be different than the ionic temperature. So that means that the mean energy of the electrons is going to be three halves of Kb uh, Te. But there is um, a situation as the electrons have more energy. Uh, it's kind of As the electrons have more energy, the probability that they're going to interact with, uh, with a proton or another electron, uh, but this is recombination, 
Um, how does that function look like with respect to the energy or the velocity? This is one of the homework problems uh, that we do today. Ramon, what do you think? Isn't there? Well, mm, give me a second. I'll sweep up my homework. So, is it easier mm -hmm. for the electrons to interact with the protons if the velocity is high or if it's low? The velocity would have to be low, no? So that they don't just like go past each other. Right. So that's one way to look at that, to, to look at the situation. Right? Like if, if they're moving too fast, they don't have much time to interact. Um, also, you know, if they have, if they're moving slowly or slower, um, then the chance that they can get trapped by the potential is higher. So then we have this um, function, so the cross section as a function of the velocity looks like that. So that means that um, this one, I don't know what happened to all my markers. So this side is going to be. Weighted, uh, weighted heavier than this side. So it's going to look more like like that. Oh. So that means that the energy, the recombination energy average, is going to be less than this. So if we want the recombination energy to be equal to the change in energy um, due to photoionization, then these will have to be um, smaller than, less than the three halves of KB TE, which means that the electronic temperature has to be greater than 2 over 3 kb, the change in energy due to photo ionization. We saw that uh, this energy is between kbt c, was the color temperature of the star that is creating this ionization area. And 2.7 kb t tc. So we can just put this one in here, and we will see that the electronic temperature is greater than two thirds of the uh, color temperature. Or in the other case, for this one, it would be 5.4 over 3 TC. So what we observe is that even though the star the temperature of the star that is creating um, this 
a mutation area is between uh, oops. Uh, yeah, that's correct. Thirty thousand Kelvin and fifty thousand Kelvin. The cloud is typically uh, less than ten thousand Kelvin. So there are other mechanisms in play. Uh, you know, this is recombination is certainly a possibility, uh, but there has to be. Um, other stuff that is cooling down the, the interstellar medium. So one of the things that we have to consider is that the particles are in you know, the so the protons, the electrons in there, they are in thermodynamic equilibrium. But the particles and the radiation are not in thermodynamic equilibrium. And it's because you know, for the most part, the mass remains in the same the same volume, the same spot. But the radiation, at least some of it, is able to escape. So the radiation um, is not in equilibrium. So if you measure, um, if you look at the spectrum of the interstellar medium, it is not going to be um, black body. So in general, it's going to look kind of just flat with some um, emission lines. So we're going to look at those uh, emission lines. So all the mechanisms for cooling down the cloud involve uh, radiation, radiation leaving uh, the cloud. So here's one example. We have this photon. It has an energy of 20 electron volts. It was produced by the star. And we have um, our hydrogen, initially neutral hydrogen atom in there. So the electron, we can get knocked off. This is just uh, an ion now, but there might be another one um, over here. So the energy of this electron when it gets knocked off is going to be 6.4 electron volts. So that's 20 minus the 13.6, uh, I guess a better way to put it is 13.6 electron volts in the ground state. And you know, zero in uh, at infinity, right? There are um, other levels, so n equals two will be uh, negative 3.4. There's a pretty big space over here. So not trying to scale. N equals 3 is negative 
1.5 and equals 4 is um, negative 0 0.8 and you know there's some other stuff in here but the, the difference between the levels becomes um, smaller and smaller okay so let's say that this uh, electron, which has an energy 6.4 electron volts, is actually, this is actually what happens most of the time, is not going to be absorbed by the proton and go directly to the ground state. Instead, Let's say that goes to the n equals three um, level. And so it can give, it, it will release a photon with an energy of 7.9 electron volts. And the electron is gonna be here in n equals three. What could be the destiny of that 7.9 electron volt photon? Can it ionize a hydrogen atom? A neutral uh, ground state hydrogen atom? No. It doesn't have enough energy, right? So what's gonna to happen to the photon? It'll just pass through. It'll probably just leave the interstellar or that part of the inter interstellar medium. So would this contribute to you know, this photon leaving the, the, the gas cloud? Will it contribute to the cooling of the cloud? Yeah, right, it will, um, but it's still, you know, in, uh, in, in aggregate heating up because this one was a 20 EV and a 7.9 EV left. So then the electrons going to decay, they could decay just to the ground state, um, more likely it is going to go to the n equals two. So another uh, electron is going to, to leave. It's going to be a 1.9 electron volts electron, I mean a photon. What's gonna to happen to this photon? Does it have the same fate as the 7.9? Why? Because it's not enough to ionize hydrogen either. That's true. But is it enough to move an electron which was in the n equals two excited state to the n equals three. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly the energy difference, right? So, you know, this one is energetic enough, but not energetic enough that it can, you know, it's in that window, it can leave. Uh, this one, is going to have a harder time. So that 1.9 electron volt um, is from n equals three to n equals two. So that's the Balmer alpha. And, you know, eventually 
the electron is going to go to the ground state. So another photon is going to be released. And this one has a 10.2. What's going to happen to that electron, I mean, to that photon? That one will probably get absorbed by a, a neutral hydrogen ring. Um, yes, it can. Uh, almost for sure it will. So that's the lineman alpha. So uh, this photon, you know, and there's something kind of weird, it's gonna be able to leave, no problem. The Balmer alpha, um, you know, it's probably gonna be absorbed and reabsorbed at some other time, sorry, um, absorbed and re-emitted um, by some uh, excited hydrogen. Um, but the Lyman alpha, you know, because it is absorbed so easily by neutral hydrogen, it's going to stay for a very long time. Um, well, if you consider that it's the same photon, obviously it's not, but um, it would be just like a random walk, you know, for billions of years uh, without ever leaving uh, the, the cloud just because the cross-section, the absorption cross-section of the Lyman alpha is so high. So, you know, maybe eventually we'll get lucky enough that, you know, the medium is not dense anymore. Maybe at that point we'll be able to escape. Um, you know, in that, in the paper from last week or two weeks ago, you can see that we can detect the red shifted Lyman alpha from other galaxies. So, you know, at some point it does escape, but it just takes, uh, it just take a, takes a really long time. And we cannot see the Lyman alpha at least easily uh, from our galaxy because um, it just gets absorbed by uh, the matter in the solar system. So, 10.2 electron volts is, you know, it's a, it's a lot of energy. So pretty much, you know, like every photon that um, deposits some energy into the cloud, a good portion is going to leave, maybe this one, but a huge portion, you know, is going to just stay as Lyman alpha. So you're going to have like, you know, a region where there is some continuum. Um, but if you're just looking at a cloud from Earth, you're going to see, or at least you will see, if you're outside of the solar system, um, all these lines, you know, Balmer Alpha, Lyman Alpha. I think the Balmer, we can see it. It's like the interaction with other atoms is rare enough that, that we can see it here. We can detect it. All right, so yeah, I mean, the cloud gets rid of a little bit of heat. Um, not all of it, or energy. So there are other possibilities. Um, you know, for example, you can interact with a, an excited electron, sorry, an excited, yeah, uh, electron and the production of the photon will be different, but it's kind of a similar uh, situation. So also remember that we know how many atoms are in the excited state. We can get it from the multiplicity and the uh, difference in energy. So you can pretty do you, you can do pretty um, 
you know, accurate calculations for what to um, expect in terms of the emission lines. So there is another possibility, uh, also not very common, that let's say that instead of producing this 10.2 uh, photon, uh, two photons are produced with total energy 10.2 electron volts. Uh, so it happens, and in that case, maybe both will be able to escape. But most of the time, it's a uh, one photon interaction, so you only get the 10.2 uh, electron volt. So, yep, this gets trapped in there for a, for a while. How long does, I mean, how often does that two photon emission occur? I think it depends on the density. So I think if the density is very low, so you know, essentially you have like a single atom in there, then it's pretty common and maybe like a, a third of the time. But to, if the density is really low, then it's, very, yeah, it is, it's a very infrequent event. So it's not, um, it's not an important uh, enough uh, phenomenon to, uh, to get rid of the energy. So right after the Big Bang, when the only things that existed were hydrogen and helium, uh, this was essentially the only mechanism for the interstellar medium, because there were no stars at the time, so the medium to cool down. And that's why it took a relatively long time, you know, for the first stars to appear. Uh, the medium was just not cold enough. And that's why the first stars were so, so massive. So you need a lot of gravity to um, to compress, you know, to, to clump um, matter together that was still so hot. But once metals appeared in the picture, and by that I mean like carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, so everything that is not hydrogen and helium, then uh, things change quite a bit. So, you know, an example of this is an example of what I'm going to talk about is the 21 centimeter uh, uh, radiation. So you have your your uh, your proton, your electron, and your electron can have a spin up or spin down. Same thing for uh, for the proton. So and of course you can't just flip it around. So what really matters is if the spins are aligned or if they are uh, anti-aligned. Right, and we saw that there was a tiny energy difference between these two states. Um, what was it, Ramon? It was like 0 0.01 Kelvin or something, 0 0.01? Yeah. I think it was 0 0.01. Just pretty tiny, right? So this is a hyperfine splitting, so it's an interaction of the spin with the angular momentum, um, essentially. So, consider singly ionized carbon. So carbon Neutral carbon is going to have six electrons. So singly ionized, this, this carbon has five electrons. So the first, say the, 
I don't know how to call them, the deepest. Electrons. Uh, there's going to be two of them. And they are in the n equals 1, l equals 0 um, state. So this is essentially your 1s orbital. And then the next two, uh, deepest two, next two electrons, uh, n equals 2, l equals 0. So this is your 2s orbital. What about the, the last electron, the valence electron? What is it? N equals what? Didn't you see this with um, Noveron? It should be n equals two, right? Or oh yeah, two and l equals one. Mm -hmm. And what orbital is it? I think that's one p. Two. Two p. Yeah. There's no one p, but two p. So. Um, This is your, so that means that this is your orbital angular momentum. And then you also have the electron spin. So it can be one half, um, minus one half. So the total momentum, you know, J equals L, which is this one, plus S. Uh, one option, well, L is always, will be one. Um, can be one half. Mm. If you subtract the one half, or it could be three halves if you um, add it. So if you're essentially if your spin is in the same direction that your orbital momentum, let's say up or down, or if they are uh, anti-aligned. So your spin is, let's say, going up if it is rotating in this direction. Okay, so those are, those are your two options. So you can write these in Russell Sounders Notation. I don't know if you have seen this with like Ravello. So it's 2p one half and 2p three halves. The notation you know, is not very important. Um, what really matters is what is the energy difference between these two states. So that energy difference is going to be. Mm, say delta E between 2p one half and 2p three halves is eight milli electron volts. So it is pretty tiny compared to um, you know, like the 10.2 electron volts, the Lyman uh, photons. But it's also pretty big compared to, um, to the 21 centimeter radiation. So this is equivalent to a temperature of 92 Kelvin as opposed to, as opposed to 0 0.01. It's much higher. So These uh, eight milli electron volts, um, the wavelength will be 
about 0 0.15 uh, millimeters. So much shorter than 21 centimeters. So there is something cool about um, this particular phenomenon. The end, you know, the energy state is the same, it's two, but the angular momentum, um, or total angular momentum, one half or two half is different. So if you think about it classically, you know, something that is just rotating, uh, what is what is this? You know, how can it absorb or release a, a you know energy? What happens if you increase the angular momentum? Let's say of a soccer ball. Increases its energy. Hmm? You increase its energy. You increase its energy. How? <laughs> By making it rotate faster, right? Yeah. So this is what's <laughs> happening to the carbon. It can absorb energy by rotating faster. And of course it is um, one size. So it can absorb that energy. So you know, start to rotate faster with interactions with other carbons, probably not going to find that many, but with other protons, with other hydrogens and with electrons. So Let's say that it interacts with a um, Lyman uh, photon. It can decrease, you know, it can take this much energy from the Lyman. Um, actually, I didn't calculate if that was enough you know, for the Lyman to leave the cloud. Um, but even if it's not, this A, MEV, now they can leave. This is going to be in the far infrared. So when it goes back to its uh, rotational ground state, uh, it emits a photon in the infrared. So this is actually how um, clouds can, can uh, cool down efficiently. It's a tiny energy. The concentration of carbon is not very uh, high, but um, it's very easy for the carbon to steal this energy and then just release it. So MEV, you know, it's, it's in the energy range of every, um, I guess of rotational energy, uh, also in molecules. So the other one that is uh, very important is exactly the same physics. It's oxygen three. So doubly ionized uh, oxygen. So this one It's going to be more complicated. It's going to have six electrons. So it has two valence electrons. Um, this is not drawn to scale. So it's going to have uh, the highest energy. So all of these are the difference in, in the total angular momentum. This one is called 
one is zero. This one is called one D two. And over here, there's three P two, three P one, and three P zero. So just like with the hydrogen atom, okay. This one is um, 5.3 EV, so this will be zero EV, the ground state. Uh, this one will be 14 MeV. This one will be 38 MeV. Um, sorry, the, this one. This one is 2.5 EV. So this is a pretty big jump. And it's close to zero compared to this one. And this one is 5.3. So these ones over here do the heavy lifting in terms of cooling down the cloud. So this one is um, equivalent to 162 Kelvin. And this one to 441 Kelvin. Right, so you're going to have other molecules uh, doing this, uh, sorry, other um, ionized atoms. But oxygen is the most common metal in the universe. Um, so this is probably you know, the process that contributes the most to uh, cooling down the interstellar medium. So, let's see. Molecules can do that also. Uh, but molecules are not super stable. Um, with temperature. So the cooling function This is a log graph. Um, this is the cooling rate in um, joules per meter cube second. And these are going to be the temperatures. Uh, temperature in Kelvin.
looks more or less like that. So this is also log in Kelvin. So you know, a cloud that is at 100 Kelvin, it's pretty cold. Even 1,000 Kelvin, it's still pretty cold. Um, 10,000 Kelvin will be like your typical uh, cloud. And then higher temperatures, um, you'll have to go to like the intergalactic medium um, or a very active um, um, sphere to, to find it. So in this region over here, The most active cooling mechanism is going to be uh, molecules. So the rotational um, energies of molecules, you know, like uh, oxygen. Um, which one is a common one that rotates nice? I guess water is one carbon dioxide, so they can um, absorb. And then uh, in this region over here, uh, it's going to be metals, um, also rotational. And you also have molecules uh, in this region, but you know, not that many. It's kind of hard for molecules. Uh, and this is the, I guess, the regime of metals. And then in this region over here, So this one is uh, recombination. So the the first one that uh, we talked about, and in this very last region. going to be Gramsci along. So this one is um, electrons interacting um, with protons, you know, mostly via Coulomb interactions. Um, in here, you have some other effects. So some of these metals can be in the uh, very excited states, like the uh, uh, 5.2 EV um, state, um, or even higher. So the metals can um, highly ionize metals. And then they will produce um, X-rays. So these ones over here, um, I guess they're lower frequency. So the cooling function is pretty complicated because you have several phenomena and they all depend in different ways um, or the dependence that they have with the um, densities, for example, on the temperatures is different. So you're not going to have molecules at these higher temperatures. Uh, you're not going to have non-ionized metals at these very high temperatures, um, and so on. So over here, the Bremsstrahlung, it's pretty inefficient uh, at cooling 
uh, down clouds. So you know, if you have something, let's say in the in intergalactic space, um, and it's really hot, the density is really low. Um, it's going to take a very very long time to cool down. Um, if you are uh, in this regime, so it will be the the boundary between like the H two and the H one regions. Uh, the, the the metals uh, plus the recombination, they can cool down the cloud uh, pretty pretty efficiently. So that's why even though the temperature of the star could be uh, thirty thousand K, maybe over here, the temperature of the cloud will be only like ten thousand. And you know, once you move to these regimes, you know, 300 Kelvin, 200 Kelvin, um, they can cool down you know, pretty, pretty quickly. So once you are in this region, it's easier, definitely easier for matter, for matter to, uh, uh, to clump. And from these, they're called molecular, molecular clouds, uh, from these molecular clouds, um, most stars, um, at least in this epoch of the universe, uh, are created. All right, so that's what I have for you today. Um, next time we're going to start looking at how those stars are formed from the molecular clouds. So any questions or comments? Dante, what did you want to talk about? Can't remember anymore. <laughs> that you hate relativity? No. <laughs> we were, oh yeah, we were talking about the one way uh, speed of light. And uh, it's impossible to prove apparently. <laughs> <laughs> And then you never answer my question from the summer. Which one? That uh, if uh, free will does exist. I told you no. It's very easy. <laughs> okay. I didn't tell you? It, it wasn't settled. Oh. Yeah, there, <laughs> obviously there's no free will. <laughs> <laughs> So that means there's no point of get, getting a higher education. Well, you don't have, you cannot decide that. If you, that's what you want, <laughs> you know, it's, it's pretty difficult to not feel it. Because <laughs> you don't really have free will. Damn, <laughs> you're so I, right. I can prove it exists right now, just by doing this, <laughs> on my own free will. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I think that proved that Okay. <laughs> well, Jorge, I choose to be in your class. Yeah, see? You have free will. <laughs> Thanks, Jorge, for the class. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm, I'm enjoying it. This Great. is the best part of the day. Good. Honestly, it's the only exciting part of the day now for me. <laughs> <laughs> wow, thanks. That's nice to hear. I mean, the, the, the rest of my classes are like politics or doing boring projects for engineering. My other classes are matrix algebra and calculus three, so... <laughs> I mean, people don't know that there's a whole universe outside. It's they, incredible, you know. The they live their is, whole lives. The universe is so big. Um, and we're part of it. Yeah, we are definitely part of it. Where the universe made itself aware through us. How do you know that? Because we're here and we're part of the universe. We're made of the same atoms that make up stars and that you just described. Yeah, but maybe the universe has other ways of being aware. 
And it might. And maybe we are not aware. <laughs> you know, the, the question that I really, that I, that I, you know, I think about it very often these days is why there is stuff rather than not. Why there are, you know, electrons and protons. Why are there physics and math? I think that's, I think that arises, you know, from the interactions, but why, why are these things there in the first place? I mean, doesn't quantum mechanics well, allow things to, exist? to pop up from nothing? They do. But, you know, so there um, it is. There's, there's really, you know, if, if you look at quantum mechanics, nothingness doesn't really quite exist. So maybe the question is wrong. You know, is there a way of having nothing? Yeah, that's, I think that's another way to ask that question. You know, I I cannot imagine nothingness. Can you imagine a universe that doesn't exist, like no universe? <laughs> what would what would be there instead of the universe? <laughs> is it possible for nothing to exist? You know, then I think about, um, you know, like electrons, more like from the field point of view. QED? Mm, yeah. No, Q QFT. Quantum field theory. So, you know, these are just excitations of some sort, right? Electrons and quarks I don't know there was a paper um, I think it was last week I was reading that uh, it says a consciousness arises from its own field from all the electrical interactions in the brain they result in their own field so they have these waves propagating through the brain yep but it's pretty much the same thing um it is, and you know, the one, one way that I think about the brain is just, you know, it's a, it's a constrained volume and you have electric, electric waves. So you cannot control um, very much, you know, how those waves are moving. I think you can influence them to a certain extent, but um, no, I'm pretty sure mine shorted out two minutes into this conversation. You're pretty sure what? Mine shorted out two minutes into this conversation. <laughs> you know, it's like the ocean. Um, if you look at the ocean, you know, it's two dimensional, like it's a surface, but you can see all the waves, right? So I imagine the brain like a three dimensional. Um, ocean with waves at every you know, every layer, and you cannot really control them. You know they're just moving. When you sleep, the frequency uh, changes, right? So most of them become like I don't know, like delta waves or something. Uh, when you're awake, you have like a, a combination of um, there's like four, three different types of waves, like the alpha, beta, all of those. And it's it's kind of incredible, very incredible. <laughs> But then, are we the perception of ourselves, or are we the action of ourselves? That would be, like, again, I think free will is like a stupid concept, uh, beyond it existing or not. Um, and I see what you're saying, like, oh, yeah, there's no free will because physics. Yeah. And that's the boring way of looking at it. I think it's too contained. Um, I mean, I'm still... Trying to see free will self-aware at this point. Free will what? Free will what? I, I'm sorry, I didn't get that, but I'm still, I, I still want to scold Jorge. Um, I'm not saying that it's not interesting to look at our behavior or even simulate oh yeah. it mm. or model it. 
But what I'm saying I, is that he's, he's not, um, he's not reductionist, right? Like you can push someone and the reaction of every person is going to be very, each person is going to be different. Then you've been the same person different times, right? It's a very different reaction. So um, maybe the person will not be able to predict, you know, that, that that's going to be his or her reaction. So I'm not saying that he's, that is not worthy of study. What I'm saying is that it's not, in principle, very predictable. You're saying it's not predictable? Mm, not very, no. By, by us, right? By us, yes. Mm -hmm. I agree, and I mean, I, I think the conversation of free will is one of the most boring conversations in philosophy, <laughs> because it's one of those where, what are you gonna argue? Like, well, what's what's the point for of, or against? Um, I usually kind of reduce the but world to what so I see exist. of it. Huh? You think and so you exist. Uh, I've, I've, th th there's come a point in my life where I even question that. Without having read Descartes actually, but I was like, could I actually not exist somehow? Could my illusions be an illusion? Yeah. I mean, so, I don't... Huh? Oh, you all have surgery, you know, you don't exist for a while, and then you come back. <laughs> that's, that's one of the things that's also interesting whenever your brain is off. Mm, it's, it's a weird feeling. Well, but I, I, just, I just wanted to disagree with you, Jorge, on, on saying that free will doesn't exist. So you think it does? Uh, no, I told you, you might be right, but uh, I, don't, I don't think the question makes sense. I don't know how, like, um, epistemologically, we can speak of free will. I don't know, philosophers are really strange people. Are very what? Very strange people. <laughs> I like them. Um, I don't know. They're almost like mathematicians, right? Like they believe really weird things. They believe what? Believe really weird things. I mean, the thing is, it's cool to have yourself not believe in anything or like not assume anything, at, at least like to fool yourself into thinking that you don't assume anything. Uh -huh. Or even see it this way, assume that you don't assume anything. No, I, I assume things and I base my assumptions on um, observations of nature. Mathematicians and philosophers give the same weight, you know, the same probability of existence to like things that almost for sure do not exist, like free will. Um, hmm, I, don't, I, I don't know if, if that, that's correct. Like, philosophers usually talk about what we experience. That's like, mm, how, or, or I think actually philosophy is a lot about language. Mm. So that's another thing that's also interesting. Hmm. Yeah, that's um, very interesting. So it's it's about it's about like it's about the names that we give to things or how we can like arrange things so that we can like consciously think about them. And since language is so um, vital for our way of thinking today. I, I think it's it's usually trying to reduce it to like a sentence, <laughs> because a lot of the time you come to conclusions that are very intuitive that are just like oh well people assume this or your people can just see this, but then you like study your own thoughts. That's kind of what philosophy does, and I don't think good philosophers give the same weight to like just whatever mm, that might not exist or whatever. It's more about something that we can share stuff that we can say about like the human condition or something like that and again i like to reduce the world to what i can make out of it even if it's not just what i see but like what i uh, perceive and stuff i think it's a much more uh, consistent um, definition of reality to say real is that which i perceive which i um can rationalize and stuff. And that's why I usually try to like separate myself from the physical world and stuff like that. Say like, 
physics and math are invented, those kind of things, because I cannot speak about this. I, I only know the world from the perspective of my own mind. That's everything I have. And people usually try to get like ahead of it. Okay. And what's wrong with trying to know more? <laughs> It's not trying to know more. I mean, I, I like trying to model things and stuff, but people assume so many things about what they can't actually interact with. So again, when I am like, oh, the question of free will is kind of a, um, I, I think those kind of questions get nowhere. Well, I mean, it's because like the way, a, the way we perceive it is the same. Either we have free will or not. Even if it's just like all deterministic physics, or if it's like soul that has control beyond the spirit, the physical world, or whatever in the spirit world, something like that. The choice that you like, the choice that you make, it still feels real to you. So, how is it any less real than the share that you sit on? So I guess uh, I understand your point. Um, but there are things that I cannot feel that are real. And you, you can interact with them. It's like a gravitational wave, let's say, right? Mm -hmm. um, I want to, I want to learn about them. You know, I'm not just happy trying to feel them or something like that. But you're still interacting with them when you model them and uh, and study them mathematically and stuff like that. And that interaction is as real as when you sit on a chair because I'm reducing you sitting on a chair to just what you feel when you sit on a chair. Because again, the whole world, I could be, again, I could be a vein of it on a bucket and that wouldn't make a difference. And the only thing that we know is that, well, the only thing that I know is that I perceive. And it, uh, like everything comes down to that. And I mean, gravitational waves are real because I believe in them and because I like interact with them somehow. Okay, what about uh, the many things that you have not interacted with and that you don't know that exist? Uh, are they not real? Uh, I would say they're not. Uh, so, it's kind of a platonic way of thinking. Yeah, I don't like Plato. Oh, you're lame. Dude, I'm a scientist. I mean, I'm a scientist too, but scientists have too much science and too little philosophy. Some of them. And even though like they are one of the most philosophical people, like Roger Penrose's reasoning to say why he's a mathematical realist sucks. I was listening to why he thinks math are real and I'm like, bro, no, what? No, that's, that's okay, a terrible so, argument. You know, Roger Penrose is a very good example, right? He's, he's a mathematician. He believes really weird stuff. It's cool, you know, we need people to think weird things and then some of them end up being true. But, yeah. you know, he has, he has very weird interpretations. Um, no, but I mean, what I was saying is that I don't like because he doesn't have a weird enough interpretation of math itself. So he has weird mathematical interpretations. And you look at his work with what we were talking about the other day or like several of the things that we talked about with him. But when it comes to like that question, his question, like his response assumes so many things. It's just like, a, well, we can do phones, therefore math is real. And it's like, mm, but maybe I'm trying to think a little bit more into that and be like, what if, how would a world where maths are invented by us, but they still have a change in the world look like? How can I like make itself consistent? So believing that math exists 
math exists is um, it's a platonic idea. Uh, a little bit, but not platonic enough for my taste. You all should just enjoy life and get some wine. Why? <laughs> That's boring. It's exactly the same point as when Jorge says that he wants to study gravitational waves because uh, he's not as happy if he doesn't. I want to study life. He will be happier if he moves to the ranch. Correct, Jorge? You want to move to the ranch and yeah. have some cattle? Yeah. Actually, I don't Anyone know. Need... I like teaching. <laughs> you what? I like teaching. Yeah, I asked you. It's the most, I would say, the most onerous profession out there because I mean, you're passing all your knowledge to the next generation. But I, I don't do it because I want to pass my knowledge to you. I do it because I want to learn more. So, sorry, it's a very, it's a very selfish reason. <laughs> Selfishness is unescapable. Don't worry about that. Well, Jorge, thank you for being selfish. I mean, you're, you're helping us too. <laughs> All right, uh, I have a paper to write. Um, Good luck. I'll talk to you on maybe tomorrow or Thursday. Okay. Bye. Thank you. It's okay. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.